Cromwell's efforts and the efforts of the Parliament to establish a new kind of government went in very different directions. Uh, the Parliament was after, as you know, more parliamentary control over the change period. I don't think Parliament itself, even the Rumpel's Radical Church, has set, ever set out to destroy the king, destroy the monarchy, but to simply find a way to contain it, find a way to control it, and where the king basically, which later happens, uh, but not till 1688, where the king will be called to reign but not to rule. In other words, he's got, he cannot call the shots any longer. Basically, that's where they were heading, I think. It appears that's where they were heading. Um, but Cromwell took things in a very different direction. Uh, he's only around to really rule the country for about five years under this Lord High Protector of the land. And I don't see in Cromwell, uh, I see a man who's not sure what he's supposed to be doing. Uh, he's, he, for all purposes, he is, he is a, uh, definitely a, a ruler, a dictator, or he's a monarch himself, without title. Uh, it's hard to know where, uh, where he was taking this. Now, how many have been reading the little book on Cromwell? Just going through it. Just one person. Hold the hand. Yeah, that one. You know, it, that's that's what I want you to get at. And that's, it's a little, good little book, I, I knew. Yeah. And it, it argues very things. Where is he going? What is he doing? Yeah. And what's his, what's your take on it? I don't think anybody quite has ever settled totally what the take is on Cromwell. Um, because I don't think he himself really knew. He wasn't, although he's a parent, he wasn't, he was, he is not particularly religious. He's not looking to build a city on a hill like the Puritans of Atlanta to get uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, he seems to be more eager to unite the British Isles, to defeat the Dutch. to streamline the economy in some sense. Um, create, possibly create a republic, which is what he actually does. There is a republic. Sometimes called a Puritan republic. But those names are kind of strange because none of it ever really fits where this went. But I think what he achieves in the long run in his five years is, and I think he, because he began to see this himself, probably the greatest calamity of the country was not the king versus the parliament, but it was the, but was the, the tragic collision of church and state that drove this civil war, made it a no holes barred war, vicious, horrible kind of war, that, can, that, that happens when, when religion becomes a part of the political, political system in some way. It just changes things. For the Puritans, it made every act in this war, every victory in this war, and every slaughter that they maintained in this war, it made it an act of God. This is God's will. You know, you can't really criticize all the Muslims around who say, you know, this is the will of God. Uh, this is. Allah, Allahu Akbar, God is great, God has done this. It's easy to criticize them, but we have done the same thing. And I think there's no question that Puritans really saw this in a, as what we would call an eschatological, apocalyptic way. They were achieving the, the end result of the, of the kingdom of God. They were going to bring about the kingdom of God on earth with everything they did. And it's very, it seems very clear to me that Cromwell is not buying into this. 
He is not trying to create a divine state. This is not uh, Puritan Jihad, okay? This to him, we beat these guys because we were better, better trained, had the weapons to do it, and had, without a doubt, the mass of the population on our side. That's what won the war, and a well-disciplined army that I recruited and trained, partially paid for, but all the recruits were part of it. Now, at the same time, this new model army itself had apocalyptic visions. We know they saw this in the, each one of their victories was a victory was the hand of God. We know they saw that. That's why they sang hymns going into battle. Uh, Cromwell may have even believed in some of that himself in the first, the first issues of these, when these battles happened in 1644-1645. But now, you know, it's almost, it's eight years later in 53, He's been struggling with Parliament. He finally says, screw you guys. I don't know where you're going with anything. You don't seem to have a, a, a clue in terms of focus. So he really dismisses Parliament. He parts ways with Parliament. Parliament dissolves, and he keeps alive a, a small portion of Parliament supporters. Let's call the rump Parliament. Creates the Republic. Moves on with that, and then it does not, it cannot sustain itself. Why does it sustain itself? Because nobody else knows what Cromwell's doing. Nobody else understands where this thing is, is heading. In other words, it's, it's, this is a nice shot. What, what, what are we doing? Where is it going? God, get some, get some sense here. Get some sanity back in political focus here. God, anybody want to see the return of the king? Yeah. Because what? Because it made sense. This is not is not making sense. And Cromwell is not making much sense of it, except for the victories that he had over historic enemies, Britain's historic enemies. Unites the Scotland, unites the unites the Irish with him in a fashion. First time it's ever been done, really done. Killed a lot of people to do it. Has victory over the Dutch. This is the first Anglo-Dutch war. He wins that war. As I said last time, captured Dunkirk on the coast and Jamaica and the Atlantic. Um, discovered Red Eye and went from there. Okay, now, I love that. Have you ever been to Jamaica? Have you been to Jamaica? Okay. Oh God, I, Caribbean's great. Just a little, a little human, just a little human compared to Hawaii, but not as many sharks. Hawaii doesn't tell you they have sharks, and they're big, and they eat you right off the Maui coast, just chomp, 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 and nobody ever tells anybody. Everybody knows not to go into Australia, though, for that reason. Australia is out of their manly in Australia. <laughs> They go after the sharks. The swimmers go after the sharks and knock the shit out of them. Just ask them, don't they? Yeah. Oh, God. The Aussies. Okay. Um, now, when, he's die, when he dies, his, his son takes over and says, I don't want anything to do with this. The son has no vision. The son never, never understood where he was going. So young Cromwell is vacillating, and the man who's trying to prop up Parliament to reestablish authority and more or less uh, pull, to, pull together a government is this very interesting individual, him, PYM, in the Parliament. He's a he's a very straight laced period. And, but there is a hue and cry across the country. They want a return of something to sanity. And General Monk, who was one of the leading advocates of the period of success in the Civil War, met with Parliament and told him, look, we need, and I will, bring back the king. The king in exile is Charles II. 
when his father Charles I was, was executed in 1649, young Charles II fled to uh, Scotland for a while, stayed there under the protection of the Scots Presbyterians. After some of just maybe five or six years, he went into exile in France, and he was really raised in the court of Louis XIV, the most Catholic king of France. Uh, probably the preeminent, what I would call the preeminent uh, visual aid of what a monarch should be, what a monarch should act like. I love Louis XIV. He's just great. He calls himself the Sun King because he radiates like the sun. He also has on his emblem the most Christian king, a solid Catholic. Uh, he is an absolute monarch in, in the most traditional sense. He runs the show in France, and he has advisors. But make no mistake, there's nobody really giving him advice. He, he does what he wants. And he builds a brand new center of, of control. It gets, moves out of the Louvre in central Paris, which was the old habitat of the French kings. And in the 1660s, 1670s, he builds a brand new center for himself as the Sun King at Versailles. It's like, you know, it's, it's a what, 10 minute drive out of Paris to get to Versailles. If you look at this thing, it is absolutely palatial surrounded by gardens, surrounded by hedgerows, and so forth. And he makes a statement, a, a, a sort of a political statement, but it's, it's a statement of his own power and how he sees himself. He has all, all of the bushes decorated in, in Baroque style. And then he has them all fenced in with French classical lines, meaning he has controlled the chaos of the Baroque. He is the man, and he sets up art academies to do tapestries, paintings, and everything else to depict this control as one who is the absolute monarch, the epitome of what a monarch should be. There is a, there is a parliament, sure enough, in France. It's called the Paris Parlement, P-A-R-L-E-M-O-N-T. I'll get your question in a second. But this Paris Parlement does one thing, they are judges. They are men of the nobility only. And what they do is approve or disapprove signed legislation that Louis initiates. Louis is not just an executive, he is, a he is the legislature. He makes the laws of France. If they sign on to it, and in order to be legal, the parliament has to sign on to it. There, is not, there was not a single law that Louis ever made that parliament during his lifetime did not sign on to. It. That tells you something. Because later, a century later, one of the great disasters of France is poor King Louis XVI never signed a law that the Paris Parliament would sign on to. They weakened it horribly. They were trying to weaken the monarchy, but they disagreed with him because he was going to tax he was going to tax the nobility. Louis didn't worry about taxing the nobility, he just seized their property when he wanted to. I mean, I love Louis' stuff. Just sort of, he's directed in your face, okay? Uh, just, just one of the characters of the history. Uh, oh, yeah, which question? It's tr which Charles was it? Because I just need to. This is Charles uh, II. Okay. Raised in the court of Louis XIV. So he's told Louis XIV's, you know, he's, he's there at the Louvre and he's there at, the, at Versailles, and Louis is telling him, you go back to England for God's sake, be a fucking king. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to encourage the Stuarts that much. Because <laughs> they're not real, you know, they're not heavy in the, in the uh, you know, six cylinder department. Uh, this car was meant to be eight cylinders, it was only running on five. This is really telling. And then the second thing is, he says, by the way, uh, I want you to promise me when you go back, and you will go back, and you will be king, and I will support you. What I want you to do is reestablish Catholicism in the British Isles. Okay. I'm hoping that. <laughs> uh, if Louis XIV wanted to uh, help Charles do that, why didn't he 
invade England. Because he Are had you more me? He had more manpower. Are you kidding me? You're gonna invade England? That's gonna really help you do that? Are you gonna alienate everybody? Even the pro-Catholics. I said, who the what who the hell do you think you are? Invading we don't need Louis the Fourteenth telling us what to do. We've just been through an upshift with Cromwell. We don't need you. They're, that that that's gonna backfire. That's like Pearl Harbor. <laughs> On steroids. Uh, no, of course not. They're going to do that. And the thing is, the French Navy at the time was sort of iffy, iffy. Meaning, they, you know, they had a better chance of just walking on water than getting across the channel. <laughs> so, and, you know, you land and you discover that, you know, all, why would it be a tough bracket? Because England has just gone through a civil war. They've got, you know, at least 100,000 guys on, in the British Isles that, have been, that are hardened veterans of the civil war. Now, what do you think they're going to do to the French army when they come waddling up the shore? They're, I'm seriously, nobody thinks about the fact this is a very tough army. They're tired of fighting, but they know how to fight. They've got the artillery, they've got the pikemen. You know, and they're, they're determined. They're not, there's no way the French could invade England at that time. It, it, it would come near to England. Sounds good. France has a lot larger population, and he's got a great, and he's got a much more control. Louis has much more control in terms of understanding how much manpower he, he actually has. Because it's a centralized country from, from Paris out, and they have, and Louis established, uh, men in his administration that that knew how to take a census and count the population, know what the population actually was in order so that we could, in fact, recruit an army. He knew what he had, but he still didn't. This doesn't mean you just take that army march. <coughs> no, nobody has ever successfully done that, ever. Germans tried World War II and they gave it up in the summer, summer of 1940. Operation Sea Lion had to be disbanded because the Germans were losing too many ships. Was he too many planes? Uh, you know, this was the great, uh, great operation. Uh, Napoleon was going to do it. Didn't happen because the Franco-Spanish Navy sucked. Didn't happen. Okay, so you have, and you know, World War II before the, before the battle ever took place, you had uh, the British challenged the Germans up in the North Sea, up on up Narvig, Norway. And no, this never. This, I don't know why this doesn't. Talked about much. It's a very significant battle as if it didn't happen. Significant because the, the German Navy just took a kick in the butt big time up there. They lost a lot of ships. They lost the kind of ships they would have needed to launch an invasion of England, which they did within a year. They launched an invasion, but they didn't have the ships. So they never moved off the French, French ports to attack the British Isles. Couldn't do it. The British Navy was still intact. It was a big navy, a good, good navy, and they, they, they worked well, good reputation. Been at it for a long time. And the Germans tried to take the French fleet. They were going to use that. And the British sailed in the Mediterranean and blew up the French fleet. And I said, why the fuck did you do that? And weren't they your, your allies? Yeah, but that was last month. <laughs> you know, they surrendered. Vichy France is not a friend. And so you, anyway. Do that this uh, but Louis is looking to do what? He has a secret agreement with Charles II to restore Catholicism, to support areas of French interest, foreign policy, and so forth, that he would not object to it. Secret agreement. Now, One year after he comes back, 1660 to 1685, it's going to be, yes? So the general who? General brought him back, he was glad to do it, and the people accepted it. Okay. Yeah. General Monk, That's good. I love these old church names, strange stuff. Uh, within, a, within a matter of just a very few years of returning, He's faced with disasters that people begin to wonder, is this the judgment of God? 
Number one, the Great Plague. Hit London. Well, it's in a series, you had already had the plague hit England about four times. This was probably the least severe and the last of the, of the three of which the plague hit. This is apparently pneumatic plague. It's by air, it's not by rats coming off ships, but please don't. We think. Uh, you have maybe a fourth of the population of London die with this plague. Hard to get figures on it. And then you have around the countryside, the plague is everywhere. But definitely not as great in the country as in the cities. And then it's followed by the Great Fire of London. However, that started. And so people are really now talking, God, we brought back the king, God's going to get us. We had a chance to establish a Puritan city on a hill, a Puritan theocracy. We didn't do it. Therefore, God is, this is God's time. We took back this guy and we shouldn't have done it. Others are saying, no, we had a civil war, which we should not have had, and that's the, the, the punishment. So you have even disagreements about why they're being punished, if they're being punished. Uh, the Great Fire destroys a really uh, historic part of what later becomes a really historic part of it. The area around St. Paul's Cathedral and a number of, uh, I'd say, hundreds and hundreds of acres. And how do you deal with something like this? You try to make the most out of it in terms of, okay, you know, some of these areas needed to be, because the streets are so narrow, <coughs> alleyways, um, just highly flammable buildings, poor living conditions, spread of disease and, and so, ramp, so rampant in parts of London because of this, the, the closeness and so forth, the closeness, the filth, da, 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 da. so finally, um, this is a great time to redesign the city. And so the government hires Charles, this is the government of Charles II, hires Sir Christopher Wren, W-R-E-N, oh, yeah. who is really a genius. What he wanted to do was redesign the entire city of London. He had a massive project in mind. He gave, he gave this project, um, models of this project, to the royal administration. This is what they, you know, this is what he showed them what they were going to do. They probably did about a third of what they were going to do when they ran out of money and had to stop. Or ran out of the will to do much more. Where is London, St. Paul's Cathedral in London? You see any films on World War II of the Blitz? You've seen those Blitz. And up around that is St. Paul's Cathedral. And it stands like a freaking fortress out here. You got the you got the background of the Blitz and the Nazi bombs going off and there's the light behind everything in flames. But you see St. Paul's Cathedral, those shots, monumental, just a sense of chills. There at the top of the cathedral is St. Paul holding the cross. You see those flames behind. That is moving. Yeah. This this is his baby. And I watched St. Paul's and I thought this is where it happened. It's a huge body. Uh, it's just voluminous. And they also had a good lunch there. <laughs> <laughs> Starving by the time I went there. And I was really needing lunch because my ex-wife was talking my ear off. And I just said, I'm really hungry. You can say why I've been married 18 times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which ones I'm going to beat in that one. They block all of them. Any bad luck. <laughs> they're all going to get even. No, they're all going to get even. No. Okay. Um, so they, they rebuilt a third of London. Okay. Um, did a great job. More open space more open space for troops to move through in case of civil disobedience. Could happen again. Same time during this reign, uh, up until 83, uh, you're gonna have some of the most remarkable people in English history living at this time. Isaac Newton as, is at Oxford. He's just published 
some of his works dealing with gravity. Who was the Isaac Newton chair at Oxford today? Hawking. Stephen Hawking. Yeah, Hawking, yeah. yeah. Incredible character. They asked him, what? Do you believe in aliens? And he says, well, it seems like there's a pretty good chance that they're out there. The universe is pretty big. He says, and don't assume they're going to be trapped. <laughs> Which I thought was interesting. You know, he's like, we don't know. We don't know. It's like uh, Columbus meets the Indians, and we're the Indians. Yeah. <laughs> Bullshit. Bill, he just. He's... <laughs> All right. Uh, this is the period in which you had a very a great bird's eye view of the people that lived at the time through Peeps' diaries. How many of you have ever read Peeps, Samuel Peeps? P E P Y S? Peeps? Diaries are great. It's a, it's a great the window into the society at the time. The outs, now there's others that are out of the, out of the picture. Nobody's reading it. That's old stuff. We don't believe it. It caused a lot of problems. Milton and Bunyan are now out. It's the, it's the time of, I, I'd say, a, um, you know, The Royal Society, a very skeptical mentality among the intelligentsia, very cynical, because they've been through a horrible period of civil war, and that does nasty things to people. They want nothing, no longer any of these issues dealing with church and state. They are so fed up with Religion is not the hot topic. The hot topic is natural law, if anything. Coming of natural law. Royal Society, John Dryden, skeptical, very urbane, cosmopolitan. Not this hard-nosed religious fanaticism. That's past, that's gone. But what they don't know is they have a Catholic king. Because he's come back from France thoroughly Catholic. This is Charles II, thoroughly Catholic, 100%. Going to restore Catholicism to England. Church of England. This is called the Restoration Monarchy, which lasts in total from 1660 to 1688. That includes James the Third, or James the Second, the son of Charles the Second. An immediate return of royal power, with some limits, as it had been before the Revolution. Church of England is now restored. The groups are now allowed that were never allowed before. It's going to create some diversity. Okay, Puritans, we know you're jerks, but we're going to allow you. Okay, just don't misbehave. Baptists, oh my God. You really don't want them. Because <laughs> they don't believe in anything that anybody else believes at the time. They don't believe in automatic salvation. See, even, even the Arminians at the time believed that God was in charge of salvation. And they believed in infant baptism. Everybody believed in infant baptism. Presbyterians, Puritans, all Calvinists, Lutherans, Catholics, everybody. You're baptized into the family of God right after birth. It's a sign of the covenant. It goes back to ancient Israel. The circumcision took place in the first seven days after birth. Sign of the covenant. Walk come the Baptist who said, No. What's your problem, dude? Problem is, you gotta be old enough to make that decision for yourself. And once you do, and you make an announcement that you do, then we baptize you as an adult. You're insane. I mean, these are the arguments at the time. 
So the Baptists are the odd, really the oddballs out here. Okay. Quakers, what do you believe? We believe that God, whoever he is, is good. We believe in peace, not war. We live in Ashland. <laughs> We've established peace house here. <laughs> Say no to war, any war. Oh, just like that. Mongols are showing up. Give them banana. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I, I, just, I, mean, I just love these guys. I love, love Ashland. <laughs> Catholics, Catholics are now allowed. They're okay. But there is a distinction made, a very big one. It's going to last a long time. Those who are Anglicans, back to the back to the restored Church of England. Those that are Anglicans are going to have greater sense of power and leadership in the country because they are going to be called the conformists. Conformists. They're going to have the government jobs. The rest of them out there. Catholics, Quakers, Puritans, Baptists are going to be understood as nonconformists. Now, I know, I know, of course, my church. Well, seriously, would have grown up hearing that, I think. They don't talk about it very much anymore. No, they do I know. You think we lost our history? He doesn't know anything. <laughs> now the deform the, the deformist person I, I have a good time joking about it. I won't get to do it next four, he's gonna be back in one night. Yeah, all right. He's gonna take all bad stuff that we have here and share it. <laughs> and trust the anchors. They're as dumb as ever. Okay. Now uh conformist versus non conformist this becomes a term that's be really relevant for the next three hundred years. And right right into the nineteenth century, through the nineteenth much of the nineteenth century. You really couldn't get a job in the administration, couldn't get a job, royal appointment, or anything else if you were a nonconformist. They didn't tell you that you couldn't be as religious as you wanted to be, but they didn't punish you with religion or burning of the state. They just said you can't get a job. Job in the government. You can't be appointed foreign secretary. If, this, is, this is one of the great, great 19th century rivalries between William Gladstone and Benjamin Disraeli. So how could Disraeli ever qualify to become prime minister? He's Jewish. Because his family converted to Anglicanism the generation earlier in order to get them in the mainstream. And it worked. He was an Anglican Jew. I don't know what that does exactly. It means you're, just, you're kosher. I don't know. Anyway, he's out there, he gets, he's chosen, and Queen Victoria absolutely loves this guy. That's mid-19th century. I love his really, he's a total character. I really enjoy it. On the other hand, if you were on the outs, you would never, you would never get this. So this is, this is the kind, this is not religious discrimination, this is just a way to limit who has the power. Nicely, and we're going to keep the power. Okay. Overseas and trade at this juncture will return to Charles. It becomes much more sharply defined. Navigation, navigation acts are passed in the 1670s that support an idea known as mercantilism. Mercantilism basically is that we have colonies on the islands, we have colonies along the coast of North America. Those colonies will supply the mother country raw products that we need, that we can use for in our industry here to sell back to the colonies. Okay, what's that got to do with navigation acts? All of the products coming and going from the colonies will be done on English ships. The 
Dutch need not apply. No I'm kidding. They hate the Dutch. But the Portuguese need not apply. The Spanish need not apply. It's going to be on English ships. The theory, going back to the old bullion theory of the prior century, bullionism, is that the more there's only so much wealth in the world, and the more you accumulate of it, the more powerful you are. And so mercantilism is a theory that, that says you are accumulating and maintaining your control of a certain amount of wealth. This is yours, baby. Don't touch it. Nobody else can have it. So once in a while, somebody flying a neutral flag tries to get involved. It didn't last long. And you said no. So mercantile, the, these laws are slowly applied in the 1670s. But the colonies in North America have already by this time existed, some of them existed, uh, for at least 50 years. They have never been scrutinized on the issue of navigation, any kind of navigation laws. Nobody's ever supervised or tried to implement these laws in the colonies. So the colonials are pretty convinced that this stuff can be ignored. But they will ship on their own ships, because by theory we are still Englishmen, and if we have ships here, we can use our ships. So the, and the government kind of allowed this. So fine, okay, that's good. If you believe that, that's fine. But just don't ship anything on, the, on French ships or Dutch ships. That's bad news. We ship with whoever we wanted to because nobody told us not to in the first place. So these, what I'm saying here, even at this time, the 1670s, these acts are coming to the Americas a day late and come short. Okay, this, this is, and, and, and they're ignored in large measure. Why? Because the colonies, as white settlement colonies, have been allowed a lot of autonomy. They had to be, because England couldn't take care of them, couldn't feed them, couldn't do a lot with them the first time early years, they couldn't do it. Tons of these people died trying to build these colonies. There wasn't much that anyone could do to relieve the suffering, especially in the middle of civil war. So you grow like Topsy, you build your power base, you think you've got, you, think you, you are self, self rule self-controlled, self-contained, and you're building up this image of yourself as, you know, you are the you are the great, you know, man of the wilderness tradition, out there in nature, and you know, building a frontier. I mean, you've got all these images. God sakes, American images in early days that we are we are just everything and the end all, you know, out there doing our thing. We all know it was Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> How many believe in Bigfoot? That's one. I'm going to bring the glass up to you. <laughs> okay. uh, now, East India Company, hugely successful during this time. Uh, open trade. English East India Company dealing now with, in India, not Indonesia, but India dealing in three big cities, all but stretching across India, Bombay. Today known as what? Mumbai. Mumbai. Okay. Madras. And across in the Bay of Bengal, you have the, one of the largest cities in India, Calcutta. Calcutta. Uh, you have East India Company factories opening up all over. They're establishing trade lines. They're not colonizing India. This is not called a white settlement colony. It's not that at all. It is basically a commercial colony. And one of the things, the successes of the East India Company in India at the time, is they didn't mess around with Indian politics. They didn't attempt to interfere with Indian religion, whatever it was. Heavily Muslim in the north, but overwhelmingly Hindu from two thirds, over two thirds of the country. You still have the country theoretically under the control of the ancient Mughal Empire, theoretically. That's slowly losing ground. Uh, but they were the, they were there to trade, period. To make to make a living there, and they, they were very successful. The British, the, the, the English East India Company had a reputation for being 
be very, very honest. High volume, low profit, and that was, it's what they allowed them to survive and made it successful. Question or comment? They didn't uh, have control here politically. They don't, yeah. They're not going to get that until after 17, after the French War, uh, after 1763. Then they'll gain control of it. Because it'll mean the end of the Mughal Empire and the end of the French control of India. Is your family from India? My dad's from India. He's from India. Where, 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 where? Uh, Bengal. Okay. Uh, Professor Centuri. Junior. Yeah. Junior, yeah. He's going to do the same thing. He's going to step into the law school. He's holding his head. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, New political parties emerging. What's the big weakness of what happened in the past with the clash of religion? The confusion in the intensity of which by which opponents took issue with each other based on the question of religion. Uh, I think that is, that's a very dangerous, horribly dangerous thing. But I'm not going to get into that. But I could, but you can see every time there is a war that breaks out in which religion becomes a big part of that war, there's a sense in which it takes on an intensity that, that, and a ferocity. And um, it just, it's no holds barred. It's a total. And you see it happen. It'll really divide a country. England was so horribly divided a couple of Okay, so now what happens is you have, instead of religious parties, involved in politics. You have the evolution of two political parties that, that survived to this day in England. Number one, the Whigs. W-H-I-G-S, the Whigs. The Whigs represent the an emphasis on the control of government by the parliament as opposed to the king. They're not anti-monarchy, but they are saying that the parliament should have much more authority than the king. Parliament has final say over everything. And this is what, what the original arguments were that led to the Civil War. Only what they're doing is leaving out the religion. Whigs versus Tories. The plural is I-E-S, not T-O-R-Y-S. I see the plural. It's like we're talking about whales. <laughs> Richard Rich is, 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 is now the governor of Wales. <laughs> Sperm or <laughs> Maybe it's the green book instead of the blue book. Oh, crap. Problems, but I don't know. Uh, so you have these political parties. The, now, here you have secretly a Catholic king supported by Louis XIV. Okay. They don't always Catholic. Nobody's really shared this much, but it's beginning to leak out. It's kind of strange. You have the political party, meaning political parties now showing up for the very first time in political history, where the Whigs in Parliament now support the king's prerogatives. If this king has a brain, he's not going to say, hey, I don't need your support because I'm a Catholic. These are what's giving him his prerogative, allowing him to make statements, pass laws, do things without creating major problems. Question? Uh, I thought the Whigs were for the parliamentary control. Oh, guys, I'm sorry. Tories, I'm sorry. Tories. Absolutely right. Thanks for correcting me. Don't do it again. <laughs> you all know my rule, right? What's my rule? <laughs> Don't write down what I say. Write down what you think I should have said. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really that's have to use, <laughs> have to use imagination. I have one real fan up here. Dude. She's, she's drunk on Pepsi. So <laughs> <laughs> Can I have some? <laughs> um, all right. He's going to 
restore the Catholic Church. He never really does that. But he's got a younger brother that's going to take over when he dies. I said earlier, when he gets his younger brother, and that is James II. So, but there's a lot of good things that go on during the reign of Charles. A lot of things are, are handled or are very correctly. Keeps Catholicism mostly a secret, but the younger brother, James II, when he comes to power in 1683, the death of Charles. James II is probably the all-time on steroid brainless anybody's list of any king of England. I mean, I think this guy is so unbelievably bad. The first thing he does when he comes to power is proclaims to Parliament, I will do what I want. I have the right. He's almost proclaiming divine right of kings, and he's saying, by the way, I'm a Catholic, screw you. And I don't need Whig support. Oh, yes, he did. He just lost it. He's only going to be around three years. It doesn't take him long to lose everything. He's about to destroy the Stuart monarchy. He's also going to make sure his son, James III, young James III, is raised a Catholic. Now, I don't care what your faith is in England at this time, the majority of the population are non-Catholics. You'd have to say uh, probably 85 to 90 percent are non-Catholics. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that they are one of anything else. They're not. They're all over the place. But they're definitely not going to put up with this. To restore the Catholic Church is an impossible idea. And he is still beholden to Louis the Fourteenth. Louis the Fourteenth, in the meantime has got occupied with other things, other wars, things going on, he's going to try to launch a war against the Dutch. Now that doesn't make the English unhappy. They don't like the Dutch. But what's he going to do with this? What he wants to do, what Louis is trying to do, is find a way to gain the financial power that the Dutch have, which is somewhat like the financial power that the English have. It's based on banking and trade, the new wealth. Banking, trade, exploration. The French can't get this off the ground. <coughs> Louis' decision is, fine, we don't, I can't make my nobles go out and go anywhere. To start a colony, to start business, to start trade, all the things that everybody else is doing, we can't get it done in France because they can't get these nobles off their ass to do anything because all the value is traditionally held in land, in the land in France. That's the old Catholic position that the French were holding to it. So what Louis XIV does, and what I'm going to do is invade Holland, and with all their bankers, with all their merchants and tradesmen and their ship, and, and we'll just take that. We can't build our own, but we'll take theirs. We'll make it part of France. Dutch response to this? Make my day. They immediately flood the the dikes. Just open the dikes up. Here comes the French army. We hope they brought their water wings. <laughs> uh, and they're going to lose really bad. These are called the, the Wars of Devolution. D-E-V-O-L-U-T-I-O-N. The Wars of Devolution. They also managed to get into, at the same time, the Dutch are fighting the Wars of Devolution. They're, they're holding their own in these wars, but they're involved in two more major wars with the English. So the Dutch are sort of getting hit all over the place. They fight the English overseas again in the 1760s. That's the second Anglo-Dutch War. And again in the 1870s, third Anglo-Dutch War. And they begin to lose the great, huge economic battle of the Protestant powers incorporated overseas. In 
And so in this area, the East India Company and the success of English enterprise begins to call the shots, begins to win the day, begins to really build, even though nobody understands it at the time, it's really building a significant base for uh, the English to operate as a very small country still. But with great political power, great financial power, because who's involved in all the investments in the East India Company and the Massachusetts Bay Company and the Virginia Company? Who are the investors in this? Parliament. You see, they are allowed to, they do invest, unlike the French, which traditionally can't pull it off. But the English can't pull it off because you have members of parliament involved in this. Members of parliament maybe who are not, who form the different breed commons. But what makes them, what gives them such clout is number one, they don't have to, if they're born second sons in a family, a noble family, they don't inherit the title and they don't inherit the land. But they do inherit the name. And that name gives them clout and they can go into any form of business they want to. They're going to become stockbrokers, investment brokers, bankers, shippers, shipbuilders, merchants, whatever they might be. But the sky is the limit. To these families that have these middle sons that, that, that probably, you know, they're never going to inherit the title. They're not going to inherit the crest. They're not going to get the land. So if they're not going to get the land, where are they going to, they're going to, but they're going to, they do have money, they're going to take that money and they're going to invest. This is how the Dutch did it, and this is how the English did it. And so as they invest, their investments become very successful in bringing money into what? Into Parliament. Now the king, theoretically, the same period of time, has a war against the Dutch. He's already, it's a good time to do it because the French are fighting the Dutch. And the, and the Dutch are therefore, you know, they got, they got, they're not big enough to fight off two countries. <clears throat> they don't like Louis XIV, they don't like France, and they're not trying to really cripple the Dutch that much. But what they're trying to do is to just let's take some of the Dutch success of the prior hundred years, see some of their assets overseas, not cripple them at home. And that's, you have the Anglo-Dutch War. So all, many of the colonies are now going to be taken over by the English. It's company warfare. But they're going to be most successful because they, they are able to do something that nobody has really thought about much. And that is the, 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 the asset situation in terms of how these companies rival each other, how the, East, how the English East India Company rivals and surpasses the much more powerful Dutch East India Company. These companies, make no mistake, are, are basically the front line of the nation itself. I don't think anybody understood that at the time. I don't think we ever, today, totally understand how that works. But first of all, how do the English companies out, out fox the Dutch? And by 1700, you have the Dutch are, are on the ground. English East India Company is, is absolutely the top, top of this game. Doing great, investments, everybody's happy. They do it because number one, they don't, they don't try to hold a monopoly over their, over their conquered areas. Monopoly is expensive to hold. You've got to have an army to do it. You've got to have your navy. It cannot just be a merchant navy. It's got to be a military navy. That costs mucho bucks. So you own your ships, okay? But what the Dutch never did, told you about this earlier, they never factored in depreciation on their ships. Wear and frickin' tear on these ships. Time they have a battle, they just repair it, but it's taking time, it's taking money. Because they own they it, they got nobody else is gonna do it for them, right? The monopoly itself is expensive to, to maintain. 
Number three, they set the prices in advance for all the goods shipped to Europe. They set the prices a year in advance. By the time they get to Europe, they don't know what the market, what kind of a market that Europe has for these items. And the market might be very dead for these items at the price they want. They can't sell. <coughs> so they lose again. The English East, End, East India Company learns right away, we're not powerful, we don't have the money, we need to operate on the cheap, and this is how we're going to survive if we survive at all. Number one, we lease our ships from various companies that own the ships, various captains that own their ships. So English East India Company ships are never owned by the company. Therefore, all of the depreciation on those ships is never paid for by the East India Company. It's paid for by who? The owners, the, the captains who own these ships, the investment corporations that own these ships. It's never the East India Company itself that pays for this. So they're getting by pretty cheap. Number three, they don't set their prices in advance from India. What are they selling from India? Things that people want. Just all kinds of spices. Pepper and cinnamon is now being discovered in Europe for the first time. It's wonderful stuff. Hardwoods of all kinds being sold. You have individual guilds from in India as weaver guilds and so forth, making marvelous cloth that's going to be sold in Europe. But you never set the prices in advance. You simply set the price when you get back to Europe, you see what the market is like, and you, you, you sell at high volume, but you sell at low prices, and you make a freaking fortune because you have no overhead. By 1700, the Dutch are choking on their monopolies that they can't sustain. And the English East India Company is free sailing, top of their game, doing great, wonderful. So it's a very, it's a, it's a, this is a very successful company. All the companies are, whatever they are, East India Company, Virginia Company, Massachusetts Bay Company, all of them are prospering, doing really well because of this policy. And one of the things about it is they're not enforcing, they're not enforcing. The, the, the navigation laws go. When they try doing that, that's going to create a lot of havoc. In other words, this theory that every, there's only so much wealth in the world, the more you get of it, this is, it's fixed amount, the, the more successful and powerful you'll be, is a very erroneous theory. But nobody figures that out until they try to do it. But what does give England the strength here, even under the Stuarts, is the fact that the king, if he has to have a war with anybody, with the French, which they will have soon enough, with the Dutch, which they are having at the time, is that the money is close to you. The money is right there available for you because it's in the hands of those who make the money who are members of parliament. So all of these company efforts feed into parliament. Members of Parliament, not they're all not all staggeringly wealthy, but there's enough money in Parliament that's close to the Crown, so the Crown can make a request and, on the, for the most part, get it. Religion is no longer the issue. There's, no, there's nothing going to stop this any longer. You're not going to have the same practice you had 50 years ago, trying to get money. Okay, now. So England's doing very well for a small country. It's got a good, it's got good, good positive ledger. Budgets, doing the budget's fine. You can always need, you can always use more money. But then you have this king who's a little bit not too well. Uh, and we're talking here, James the Second. James the Second makes this decision that he is going to now try to enforce the policy. That he is a Catholic, that he's going to make his son a Catholic. And just three years into his reign, not having learned a thing, and we always said that the Stuarts simply have this huge inability to learn. I don't know if that's inherited or not. 
genetic trait? I don't know. I mean, but nobody, nobody, not the Scots, Welsh, Irish, English, nobody's going to support this. The Catholics in Ireland are not saying very much because they've come under the, the heavy rule of Cromwell just a generation earlier. They're not that well connected to Parliament. They still have their own Parliament. So that's that sort of negate any Irish opposition. Uh, but the Catholics are, you know, they're a minority in the rest of the British Isles. So when he proclaims this, there is a general outcry to remove him. And it's coming from his greatest supporters, the Whigs. Parliamentary Whigs are saying, this guy's got to go. I'm sorry, I'm doing, I keep doing this. Um, the Tories. The parliamentary Tories are saying he's got to go. The very party that's upheld his prerogatives is the very party that says he's under Caius. And he has. I mean, he's totally, he's totally pulled the rug out from his supporters. So they're against him. So a decision is made in Parliament based on the theories of probably one of the most brilliant philosophs of the day, the English philosoph. His name is John Locke, L-O-C-K-E. Now the decision is this, remove James and his son from any, any amount of succession. James is going to be gone. His son James III will not be allowed to step into succession. We're going to call a new king and queen to rule over us. And it's Parliament that's going to make the decision to do this. 1687-88, Parliament called William of Orange, who was married to the sister, William and Mary. Mary is related to James II, the sister. She married William of Orange. She's a Protestant. William of Orange is the stat holder or state holder of Holland, he's a Protestant, to come and rule England. To come and rule by act of parliament. And nobody lifted a finger to defend James. No. This is called the Bloodless Revolution of 1688. He marched over with Dutch and English troops across the channel, of course, on ships with Dutch and English troops, <clears throat> marched straight to London. And uh, we don't know how he, how, what just, how uh, <clears throat> James escaped. But he escaped back across the channel to the court of Louis XIV. Help me, Louis. I'm in a whole lot of trouble. Uh, I tried to do what you said, and, and it didn't to, work. Yeah, it didn't work too well. Um, it's probably when I announced my kids go to be Catholic that they got pissed off. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> uh, but they just they get fed up with this stuff. They don't want it again. But he is called to reign but not rule. William and Mary are the first rulers that are coming that are called to reign but not to rule. Basically, that's what the old Civil War had been about in its, in its earlier instances. I thought the English would be Dutch. They're fighting a war. Oh, they're always stuff. fighting the Dutch. But so, you know, but politics are politics, and, and money is money. And here you've got a Protestant who is married to the Stuarts, stood the test of time, time to make a movie. Uh, they're over the wars. The last war was in 1670. So you now have almost. You have about, what, 17 years between the last war and making peace with the Dutch and getting, getting off of it. The Dutch are a big thorn in the flesh to the French, so you don't mind that. That's good. So when Charles uh, II was, was brought back by General Monk, they 
sort of gave them the responsibilities of pre-Civil War kings. They just kind of went back to the way things were. They kind of went back to what they had before. It's not clearly defined, but what they did establish was political parties. One party supported the king's prerogative, the other party, another was bloodless. It's not religious hate. It's just this is a political party, which now is much more civilized than religious parties, which are always killing each other. So you have that sort of secular uh, interlude here that comes in that really moderates the politics of, the, of that time. Go ahead. Or, yeah, go ahead. I mean, but like, as far as like calling an army and things like that, that went back to the king and parliament went back to taxes. Pretty much, but nobody's going to call anything. There's no conversion rules, no issues that are out there where you would have to call the military for any reason. They're not fighting each other anymore. They found a way to manage, found a way to manage the, the hate and the divisions through the process of probably the most harmless institution ever developed, and that's political parties. We know they don't do anything. They look like something, but they don't they never get anything done. They're not too dangerous unless they're in Nazi Germany. But you know, I mean, the Whigs and Tories, and they went at it, but they didn't really kill each other. One supports the king, the other supports Parliament. And they keep religion out of the whole system because they neutralize religion by allowing everybody to be there, except if you are a conformist, you are, you're, you're a top 10 guy. If you're not conformist, you're at the bottom 90. That's, but it's a much more civilized way of handling things. So what I really like about the study of this period is the English find a way handle these issues, harness these issues, and make them work for them. And now you have William of Orange and William of Mary on the throne. The first thing they did was celebrate this by building a university in Maryland. William of Mary University, established almost the time of the coronation. It's probably one of the great universities in this country. It's the oldest one, isn't it? Huh? It's the oldest one in our country? I think it is. It's yeah. older than Oxford. Uh, it's older than, uh, I'm sorry, Harvard. Harvard. Can't tell that. Can't tell that to anybody. <laughs> they know that God created Harvard before He created the Earth. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's look a little bit right now. Well, no, I think I'm going to waste. I'll wait on that. Uh, what goes on with here with this coronation and so forth? To rule, but not to reign. Uh, to reign, but not to rule. Keep that in mind. This government will be subject to Parliament. This is how it all worked out. And it's based on something that came out of the time. It's called, John Locke wrote a work called Two Treatises. The two treatises are essentially treatises on government. And he wrote a second, it's called the Second, the second Treatise on Government. Uh, he wrote these in, first in 83, the second one in 88. They become the model for the new constitution, what is considered a constitutional revision here. First of all, in the treatises, he's a philosoph and he bases a lot of his language on the earlier writings and discussions of a very early, very ultra conservative philosopher uh, named Thomas Hobbes, H O B B E S. Hobbes wrote a work called Leviathan back in the 1630s, in which he said, Man in a state of nature way back when, an anthropologist would just really love this one, and this what is man in the state of nature? What does that define? What was that? Okay, it's, it's, it's sort of like once upon a time, but you're so, chaos rule, and men chose, you gotta be politically correct here, people chose, uh, a ruler to rule over them, in which the duties of the ruler was to simply rule and 
what is the position of the people who are ruled to simply obey. This is a one-sided coin by Thomas Hobbes, where the king is seen as the mortal god. And believe me, James I, when this was written, loved this. Uh, he thought it was a personal treatise from God himself <laughs> to James. It's from Thomas Hobbes, who was not trying to support divine right. He's just telling, he's expressing a theory. Well, that, that thing continued to grow. Thoughts about that grew. John Locke, a generation later, writes the treatise on government, where he says, OK, people in the state of nature, I'm going to use his language, man in the state of nature has chosen a ruler to rule over him. But there's a condition on the ruler. If you call the ruler the king, there are, there are conditions. Number one, the king, well, the conditions on the king. Now, there's no conditions on the king in, in Hobbes' theory, but there is in John Locke's theory. Conditions are the king. The king must rule wisely, justly, and fairly. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> I could try telling that to Henry VIII. Yeah. Wisely, justly, fairly. On the other hand, the people's response is to rule, is to obey the king unless he doesn't rule wisely, justly, fairly. In which case, you have the right to remove the king and replace him with another under natural law. Now you're giving this whole idea of natural law a lot of weight. Because it's really never been used before. Why is it carrying so much weight with politics? It carries a tremendous amount of weight because Isaac Newton had just defined the concept of natural law in the universe, the first of natural laws being the law of gravity, and if natural law existed to conduct, to control the affairs of the universe, the solar system, or whatever, and in those days we're talking about the solar system mostly, because nobody knew about anything like the expanse of the universe. But it's natural law. And once Newton defines what is a natural law, Others said, or, or if that could be defined, there must also be natural law in the world of rulers, politics, and so forth. The natural law must, we just need to find out what they are. Well, this absolutely has, this is so much better than trying to establish some kind of concrete rule through divine right, or religious imperatives, or theocracy. This sounds so much better. It's already out there. God has wound up the universe. He's let it go, and he's running it by natural laws. Let's just keep God directly out of it. Let the universe function as itself with all these men, and find out what these laws are. And so John Locke comes up with the natural law saying, okay, this is how we do it. Now, in comparison with Hobbes, Hobbes said men I'm not using the word I'm trying to be sexist here. But men had to be ruled because there was something really wrong with them. It's called a sin nature. They are inherently bad news. Okay. So he's still bringing theology into this and saying that they, we have to have a ruler over because they're, they're, they're a pain in the ass. They're really evil. And working 10 years of the probation department, I'm convinced that he's right. <laughs> then along comes Locke, who says, I can't say that. Locke's statement is this, that, that there is no sin nature involved. The man, as he exists, is a tabula rasa. 
Black Slate. Do you love the tabula rasa part? It's a blank slate in which human government writes whether you're going to be good or evil. It's not, the, it's not nature. It's nurture. Same old argue, arguments today. Nature or nurture. So if you have a, if you have a government that is oppressive, where people have no rights, where people are abused, and so forth, it's going to create social conditions that are so bad that it's going to create people, it's going to make people really evil. So you blame the government. And at the time, you can blame just about any government for having things like that go on. Torture was common and so forth. Here, you, you just get a ticket. Ashland PD is big brother, they're always looking for you, and they're going to get you. Okay. They love you. The city of Ashland loves you because you're going to have money. So the Bill of Rights now states this condition, it's a tabula rasa, and you have all these things built into it. And therefore, the people are brought into this as the, as the bottom line measure. The people should have the right to vote for the rulers, both the men, both the men, and so forth. But you're not going to vote kings out, kings out. You're going to vote kings, ministers in and out, and so forth. So you have a greater emphasis on the rights of people. When this revolution is through by 1689, William and Mary are on the throne. They're reigning, but they're not ruling. Parliament is largely in control of the person and everything else. The big issue that started almost a century ago has been settled in favor of the parliament, but with a king as a figurehead. It may not be that closely defined, but Locke has come as close to anybody to defining this the right of the people. And so all kinds of voting, redistricting took place. You didn't have really organized voting before this. So it's now taking place, giving people the right to vote for who? The members of parliament. Who's going to go for parliament? They did not write, they did not vote for the members of the House of Lords. But they did for the House of Commons. And so the individual member that's going to run for Commons the position is, we've said it before, to stand for Collins, he's because he's going to have to pay his own way if he goes. But how many people, even with this change, this is a dramatic change, this is really the birth of democracy in the West. How many people had the right to vote once this went into effect? One in 350. Because there are enormous, quality, there are enormous property um, laws here for the right to vote, you have to have so much property, property qualifications, education qualifications, which most people didn't have. It's not going to change until the Reform Bill of 1832, in which that's going to be reduced to one in 35 has the right to vote. And later, the Reform Bill of eight, the 1850s, it's going to be one out of two that has the right to vote. Who's going to be left? Right on. I keep going. Should have never let it be got beyond this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> when was the first vote for the House of Commons? Well, you can take it back to Anglo Saxon times, probably. It, it's, it's way back. Um, but the first real vote for Commons it takes place just before the Civil War. But you really don't have to, it's not a vote per se. It's a matter of being able to afford to be part of the House of Commons uh, because of your financial status. And there's, there's a lot of debates about that. 